good afternoon everyone and this is going to be rather informal so uh, there is no strange or odd formula or notation in here so it's hopefully it should be relatively clear it's going to be practical and it's going to be about tipping point analysis which in the end is closely related to missing data so most of the concepts I'm going to touch base on are will be relatively familiar to all of you. So in fact, missing data, so these two missing records are the root cause of everything for this presentation. And the biggest point here is that since these missing data are in fact missing, the only thing which we can do with respect to their nature is to make assumptions, which is, it's really difficult to know to, to know why each single data is in fact missing and and every assumption which we make as I neither hides to be tested or we need to let's say investigate what happens if the assumption which we make is not in fact true and the impact which this has on analysis downstream and also to cross check with inter with the interpretation which we're going to make from these results. So I believe we all know the liturgy about missing data types. I've, I've short, I've given here a short, a very brief overview. So we have data can either be missing completely at random, which is the the simple situation where for 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 whichever reason a data point is not recorded as absolutely at random. So there is no real explanation. It's just a, the example which I've which I've reported here is that. The device which measures the endpoint simply fails to produce a measurement by random because it has a there is I don't know, some kind of a bug in, in the in the machine which simply doesn't make it work. The data could be missing at random, which is as a slightly more strict situation where the data, the fact that the data is missing is totally and completely explained by the data which we have observed. So, for instance, the example which I've reported here is the, de the device which measures the endpoint as some faulty behavior when females are being tested. So we know that the fact that, uh, that the subject being measured is a woman is completely giving us all the information which we need to see to, to say whether the, the, the measurement is going to be missing or not. And then there is the one which every statistician and investigator is really concerned about, which is the missing not at random, which means that the fact that an observed record is not observed, that the record is not observed is due to the, to the, to the value of the record itself, which means that the example which I've given here is that the device is most likely to fail in providing a value if the value is above a given threshold. A very common example when it comes to social surveys is when you ask people to provide their income. Uh, it has been seen that people with the highest level of income are the ones which are going to be the most likely individuals not to report it. So in that case, we that case is a very obvious scenario where the data are going to be missing, not at random. Most of the statistical methods which we used are perfectly working with missing not at random and missing complete at random yeah the first the first acronym is mcar not mnar obviously and missing at random but no method itself is really fit for purpose when data are missing not at random so what usually happens is that you within your study protocol statistical analysis plan or whichever documentation you're going to write you will specify a primary analysis which is usually a maximum likelihood based method. It, it can be an uncover, it can be a mixed model, it can be whatever it's fit for purpose. And this work, these methods work fine when you when we have missing at random or missing complete at random data. And if there is a large amount of missing values or if there is any valid scientific reason for doing it, we perform what we call a sensitivity analysis using any reasonable imputation method, be it a very simple one as the last observation carried forward, 
which in fact is not really is not much um, sponsored by the authorities but it's still quite commonly used or we can perform multiple imputation just to provide to taking it to take the let's say the data generation process into account when generating these new, these new data points the idea of sensitivity analysis is that we are testing how sensitive in fact is the main results when we do let's say fill in the gaps in the observed data if the data are going to be missing at random or completely at random with what we do expect is that the available data are a good representation of the missing ones so the results should not be that should not differ that much and if and if they do differ then we will see what what happens however what do we do if the data are missing not at random this question is actually ill posed because we will never really know if the data are truly missing not at random we can make the assumption or we can assume that they are not missing not at random and see what would happen what would be the impact on on all our analysis and interpretation if they actually were so just to show you what might happen i have there is a very simple simulation here so we have 100 patients randomized to two treatment groups the endpoint is a continuous one analyzed using a, uh, a, uh, a, a, I think it's generalized linear model using sex and treatment, gender and treatment as fixed effects. So it's assuming it's an equivalent study and there is a margin of minus three plus three. The data were simulated in order to have <clears throat> um, to have the active compound to provide um, a, a mean value which was at least three uh, which was higher by three points compared to the placebo so in theory these two drugs are not equivalent because obviously with the margin of minus three plus three and the mean which is already higher by three then i, I would expect the different the, the, the confidence interval for the difference between treatments to, to not to lie within this minus three plus three bounds then we have i have generated some missing data by simply either removing randomly 20% of points, either removing 20% of points from the female, from the female patients and 0% on the male patients. And then using the to generate missing not at random, I have given a 99% of the data to be missing if they were above 13. In this case, this is this is going to have a, quite a very relevant impact because most of the data which are above 13 are going to belong to the active group, as we're going to see. In fact, these are the results on the full data set and on the incomplete data set. If you see that when, um, up until the missing at random data, results are more or less the same, which means that, to, roughly speaking, this the the observations which are left in the data set are a good representation of the of the full data set but when we go to the to the missing not at random we see that the results do change quite a lot not only in terms of in quantitative terms but also in qualitative terms because now if the MNR data set was the one which we were actually provided we would be we would declare the two drugs to be equivalent and that would only be because we have RTF because all the highest data points have been removed from the active, and thus we have a very lower we have a lower we have a lower estimate for the mean, which is 13 compared to the 14.4, which is the correct one. So obviously, this is quite a problem because we will never know which of these which of these three scenarios are going to apply. We will only know that we need we need to be aware that if this happens this is going to lead to, 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 to a false claim of equivalence which can be quite bad in the end if the drug is not equivalent so can we can we test the short answer is no because for us to be able to test the missing not at random we will need to have the we will need to have some some of the missing data available to make this judgment 
And whereas in some social service, you can you have the recall option, so you can call back people who didn't respond to see whether this happens. Within clinical trials, usually you don't have the, we don't have this privilege. What you can do, however, is to check how, the, how severe departures from the MR, MAR or MS, MKR need to be in order for this departure to have an impact on your results. So, and this is the reason for tipping point analysis, which really means push down this little coin down the slope and see how fast this coin starts to roll as we move away from the starting point. So, in a nutshell, what we do is we do a standard sensitivity analysis using multiple imputation and we create like 20 or 30 or how many, how many we want imputed data set. Then we modify the values which have been imputed by shifting them, which means we assume that the multiple imputation model doesn't provide the correct estimate for the missing data, but the estimates for the missing data need to be uh, shifted downward or upward, depending on what we believe is a reasonable shift we want to apply. Then we redo the analysis using the multiple imputation approach, which means that we combine estimates from all the imputed data set using the standard error provided by each data set as a way to account for us for multiple imputation uncertainty. We get results and we see, okay, this the confidence interval under using this shift value, is it leading us to a change in the inferential results of the study? Yes or no? If no, that is good. If yes, then we need to check how large the shift has been and how credible, how meaningful, how relevant is this shift going to be in practice? So is this a shift which could happen or not? The idea is that, as said before, if the data are missing at random, then the ones which you, we observe fully explain the missing data and so the average predictions which we're getting from the complete, from the observed data should be should be more or less realistic and should fit what we have in the what we do not have as missing. However, if they're not, so if this prediction do not in fact reflect what the missing data are, we do the tipping point analysis to see if this if this difference is really very, if is really relevant or not. So this is a briefly the SAS code. So we have the, the multiple imputation step, which I've used this min match which is just the way what it does is just fits a model and then once you have the once you have the um, once you have the predictions it checks for every imputed value it figures out which are the five of five observations which have the mo the closest prediction to this missing value and randomly select one of the five observed value as the imputed one then we analyze this imputed data, the imputed data set using, in this case, a proc mixed with a by statement. And we will get results for every imputation. And then with proc may analyze, we, we put everything together using the standard error as our measure of waiting for, of waiting for, the, for the uncertainty. And then we do, on this simulated data, data set, we, we, we do apply the shift. So if the data is missing, we add this, this shift. That we use this to be a, a stochastic shift to some extent, not just a hard, mode, a hard number. But by doing this, we make sure that we're adding a consistent shift to all the imputed data sets. And then we do, we analyze the shifted data set and we combine the results the same way as we did before. And these are the results. So you see that GLM and multiple imputation are substantially similar. Whereas if you look at the tipping point, what we see here is that if we were to apply a shift of 1.5, the, the results would change because we would have a, a confidence interval which is, um, which is not anymore contained in the minus three plus three margin. So if we were to look at this, what we would say is that it really takes a very small departure from the assumptions that, yes, that the missing data and the observed data do have a very similar pattern. 
to completely change the re our conclusions. And if this 1.5 shift is something which might which is reasonable, so it could well be that you know we know the instrument and we know that this that in fact the, the numbers which are missing could in fact be 1.5 high one, higher by 1.5 compared to the original to the ones which are available then this means that the main results are either questionable or need to be supported by some further analysis which take which take this into account one thing which you could do is to analyze shift from 0.5 to 1.5 with some more granularity just to see exactly which is the shift which leads to this change so is the shift closer to 1.5 or closer to 0.5 for instance with your assurance on missing data influence on results that's important because you, you, you never really know the you never really know the impact of missing data on results substantially because you don't know what the missing data look like themselves so tipping point do tell you to some extent which is their impact it's not mandatory so nowhere is written that you have to use them or you're going to be your the study is going to be rejected but in some cases the authority really wants you to use them in particular if you have a lot of missing data and if the reason for missing data is not obviously um, a random one so in this case for this binary endpoint since it could be due to you know if the data are missing because of a lack of efficacy it could be that the reason why they're missing is because they're all no responders so really that is a case of missing not at random and you will need to check for it and then yeah the, and then we have the regulatory reason for it as you can see, this is the end. Thanks, everyone.